excited to hear both of these readers. Um, I would remind you that we are now on the airplane of poetry, so please silence your phones. Um, so we're going to hear from Emily Pettis first. I'm going to read her bio and then say a couple of things about her. So she is the author of the book House of Sugar, House of Stone. This is her very first reading from the book, which is super exciting. Thank you so much. Yay. Even though we do not have balloons. Um, as well as the chapbook Backyard Migration Route, which explores her Mexican-American heritage and her childhood in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. She holds degrees from Stanford and the University of Houston, where she was poetry editor for Gulf Coast, where a few of us worked with her. <laughs> Yay! And did other things, like drunk. <laughs> Don't put that on the internet. Um, and taught with writers in the schools. Her poems have appeared in journals including Crab Orchard Review, Calix, Borderlands, and Diagram. She is a high school dean and English teacher in Denver where she lives with her husband and sons. I will say that this is the poetry book that I am most excited about for 2016. Oh. So it's awesome because it's only March and it's here. That's also devastating because it means there's the rest of the year. <laughs> um, and I had the privilege of reading this book a few years ago and thinking, wow, this book is better than most first books I've read, period. And then reading the new draft when it got accepted and thinking, what, did, what the hell did she do? She made it even better. Um, so I know that we're in for a treat. Um, Emily has an amazing gift with music. She takes stories that we already know and turns them on their heads. She changes the way that we understand what it is to live in a family. Um, and I, I'm going to do a weird thing and quote from my blurb, um, which I hope Jamie never had the chance to do again. But I really strongly believe this, that by the time you leave the wilderness of her singing, you will be changed. So please welcome Emily Pettis. Thanks for that intro, Sasha. Um, I should have known to ask Sasha to blur my book even before I sent it out because then when people would say, what's your book about? I just quote Sasha's blur because she <laughs> says what my book is about so much better than I ever did. So thank you for so many things, Sasha. Okay, I'm going to figure out. Right here. Um, so first off, as Sasha said, this is my very first reading from the book. It came out this month. And so it's really exciting to be here and be reading from it in my home state. And I want to thank Melbourne and Joe and uh, whoever put up the awesome sign with the red letters. I was like, <laughs> this is so rock and roll. And, um, and thanks to Ryan for reading with me tonight as well. Um, so let me just get started. Um, I'm going to read tonight from my new book and then one piece from my chapbook, and then one piece that's not in any book. Um, and so something, uh, something awesome happened to me today. Uh, one of my friends actually requested a poem. I've never had anyone request a poem before. <laughs> so it's, that was kind of like being a rock star too, or more, maybe like being a pianist at a piano bar, but you know, <laughs> I'll take it. So anyway, I'm gonna start with that poem the request poem. Um, so this poem is called Verge. Spring formed, honed, run ready. I was a switch almost thrown. I was a pulse quickening. I asked the wind, what do you know? I asked the wind to warn me. My shuttered eyes grew sensitive to figures framed in doorways. I slept with one ear always up, attuned to nighttime's yawn and creep. I slept with shoes upon my feet. I learned to dream of getaway, so even if but half awake, I'd move, and move precisely. I kept the burner on. I was coiled, I was quivered, I was cocked. I was a sudden summer storm gathering, ready to rage, then blow myself to droplets, diffuse, ungraspable. All right. Um, so I have a lot of poems that are drawn from fairy tale scenarios and they deal with my own anxieties about being both a child and a parent. Um, so I'm going to read some of those fairy tale pieces and I'll start with the very first poem in the book. And this poem is called Lullaby. Lullaby. Where is the girl? Where, where is the girl who hid in the woods? 
when wolves came? Where is the boy who broke brambles with his hands? Why were the two setting down stones? And where should the stones have pointed? Which were the minutes they felt most alone? Before the wind wept or after? Once sure of what awaited? What words did they slip to the shivering air? And what was the sound that silenced? What did the owl's eye blink from that night when the moon refused to linger? Where did the mouse spill his hard-won crumb when the shadow passed slow over? Did the trees hollow not hold? Was the river too wild to ford? Why so still, why so still? And why no fire yet burning? Who mouths the mouse? How owns the owl? And when cries the on-blowing wind? When I was in grad school with several people in this room, there was a poet in one of my classes who was leaving the program to get married and he wrote all these poems about like um, disastrous marriages and I just thought, wow, someone, hope no one tells you know his fiance about this. <laughs> and then um, I started writing poems about like, uh, disastrous families, and so anyway, I hope none of you talk to my children about this. <laughs> this poem is called, A New Mother Discovers Emptiness. That winter, I resigned my role as hope. With only two hands, smaller always than I'd needed, and twice as many yearning mouths to fill, I concocted so stories, songs, and spells, and once we'd sucked the marrow clean from words, I spun, I wove, I kept conniving to confect, but there's only so much sweetness in the world. I poured pity on the two of them, just children still, all their pleasure flown. In each other's faces, we reflected want, so I sought solace on my own. I found it first within the darkness of the woods, which rendered me invisible. I found it next, within the distance of the stars, whispering how minuscule, how meaningless my sorrows. Who insists on being heard when faced with all that space? What is emptiness when perched upon the lip of a black hole? I tried to teach those little ones to see. I pushed them toward the door. And when they would not go, I locked them out myself. Here is a pathway, here is bread, I said. You'll learn these walls were never real. Make a new home inside your head. To those who ask me, what if they're calling in the woods? I say, at least they've learned to sing. And to those who wonder, what if they're trembling with fear? I say, then at last they're full. And this one is called Advice to My Younger Self. Paul. This is no father, man of sticks and splinters, a kindling heart unaware that each match will catch its passions. Remember, it's never enough to banish flint from the kingdom. A field mouse will reveal the alternate route to the hideout. The spinning wheel spindle always arrives on the crone's cart. And this is no mother, woman of bread crust and broom dust consumed in mapping her shadow, turns her back while the dogs and rats roam the larder. It's not that your songs don't amuse. It's not that the tricks of your little bird hands do not please, or that you should search harder, run faster, from forest to field to hearth with your mouthful of seeds, extra mouthfuls for all in your pockets. No. If the pond swill ever stills to a glass filled for scrying, here's what it might show. In the hollow tree's hull, blind furless kits hiss as the falcon describes its circles, but in the room with no door, no one ever knocks or enters. All right, I'll switch gears a little bit. Um, this next poem is called Perfect Wife, Something I Know a Lot About. <laughs> Perfect wife. 
Be doing, be done. Be done unto, be under, be asunder, but holding strong. Be slow thighs, be patient eyes, be looking blindly at. Be a pretty putty tat. Be blank, be long, be sleek and strong enough for a woman, but made for a man. Be made for baking and tea. Be pies cooling in the shade of sills and eaves. Be leaves leaflessly falling. Be someone's true calling. Be melon balling and drawling. Be celebratory, emotive syllabics, fantabulatics, dramatics, and static cling. Be anything that makes them sing. Be merry, be bright, be pearly froth and silky tights. Be flash bulbs popping on the stockings glitter seam. Be cream, be dream, dream, dream. <laughs> <clears throat> And then, I, this is astounding to me, even me, but this next piece, uh, this next piece made me realize maybe my children have been reading my poetry, <laughs> so this, which they can't read yet, but this next piece is called Child Story, um, and it's taken from a conversation I had with my son, who's now five, but um, maybe about a year ago, when he was getting really interested in uh, being kind of scared by things that he heard and watched. So this, uh, this poem contains both his words and my thoughts about his words. Child story. I'll tell you a story, mama. A boy goes on a journey, mama. His mama says, no journeys. <laughs> Already my son understands how to birth a story, the push-pull of people with different wants, Threat in the shape of one who disobeys. He crafts suspense, the heart spark of the child on the verge of flight, the heart stop of the mother of the flying child. Then he goes to the forest. Is that the scary part? He tests my face. He knows there must be a scary part, knows the unknown is where fear resides, that lurking in the leafy green may be something enticing, erasing. He meets a lion. Is that the scary part? No matter, no lion lives near this state. No matter the name of the threat, the metaphor poised to break my tender boy. And the lion is hungry, mama. And the lion attacks him. I keep my face, my voice quiet. I am not sure the child is dead. I wait for what hero or moral will pop from this darkness. And then his mom comes looking for him, and she meets the lion, and she says to the lion, please eat me. I ask why she wants the lion to eat her. She wants to see the boy again, mama. And he knows just what I would do. Just what I would say, that I would scour the lion's stomach for my son, that I would join my son in the interior, that I would not go on without my son, that I would tear the lion throat to haunch as it opened its jaws to receive me. And the lion eats her. Then she finds the boy. In what condition, I want to ask, but don't, waiting for him to explain if the two are stewing in lionly innards or the two are holding hands, Jonah and the whale style, ready to tickle the lion into launching them towards safety. And no such ending comes, just the mystery of why my son circles around eaten children, searching mothers, the need to create something that scares me, gets a rise, a reaction, reassurance perhaps that I would be that mother diving into the unknown, ready to fill her hands with whatever she could salvage. All right. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit um, and read a poem from my chapbook. Uh, as Sasha mentioned in the intro, this poem is really a lot about growing up in Texas um, with a Mexican father and a white mother um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And this piece I'm going to read is a longer poem that's written in short parts. And so just to give you a sense of what it looks like, it's, it looks like little poems with little titles on the side. And the titles on the side are each in Spanish. 
You don't need to know Spanish to get the poem. Um, the poem is called My Father Quotes Jaime Escalante. And for those of you who remember your 90s movies, uh, Jaime Escalante was the AP uh, calculus teacher in the movie Stand and Deliver, um, who helped all of his inner city LA students get fives on the AP calculus test. And um, in the movie at least, who knows if the real Jaime Escalante said this, but in the movie, Jaime Escalante would constantly say to his students, you burros have math in your blood. And my dad loves that line and he would say it to us <laughs> all the time. So this poem is called, My Father Quotes Jaime Escalante. Herencia. You burros have math in your blood, he says, tracing Aztec aptitude for angles and arcs to my A's in calculus, making math skills akin to skin color genes. Cull my chromosomes for Spanish then, at large amid leukocytes hid in hemoglobin. My tongue can roll an R, twist an AK into a Y. It can ask with question marks both right side up and upside down, but it cannot speak with surety, select correct vocabulary. If X is heritage, then Y is unknown. Un factor. You may feel most comfortable with the word Hispanic when we first meet Latina, Chicana, Mexican American. Don't color light enough. And when you hear me say my name, you may decide to question it. Pettis? Pettis. Pettis. Until you settle on correction. Oh, you mean Perez. En la casa y afuera. My father learned Spanish in secrets and whispers, all his parents kept hidden from children, all he wanted to know. Spanish rolled wrongly off my mother's tongue, northern adventurer or more northern imposter, married a language not her own. We didn't speak it at home. I learned Spanish at school. Dirty jokes and curses, words for color and person, bolia, white bread, pinche, stupid, Formal syntax in the classroom, my teacher, the soccer coach, framing all in terms of el football. You've got to stay in the game. You've got to go for the goal. Spanish came to visit in the clothes of dad's family. Spanish came to stay in my dying grandmother. Summers in Spain, Costa Rica, Bolivia, brothers in Chile, Peru, the Mexican border just miles away. Spanish, a riddle whose end I never knew. Tres preguntas y una respuesta. Question. How did you get that last name? Question. You don't look Mexican. Do you want to hear a joke? Question. <laughs> what do you say to a Mexican on a bike? Answer. Stop, thief. Get it? That wasn't offensive, I hope. Mal equación. The year mom almost died, we orbited magnets from opposite poles enclosed in parentheticals lest we expose our frustration i a standard teenage deviation and he almost divided in two i packed my bags for boarding school to conceal all our grieving spats we spoke of little more than cats mitad away from him i am unknown not a doctor's daughter in a border town, but a brown name, white face anomaly. I don't add up. Half my life is in that home, half my life away, and only half of what I say is true. The problem with a story. La Fisica. My father quit physics to become a physician. With two brothers, musicians, and a sister in business, I was his last hope for a physicist child. In college, he'd send me his alternate course names, hoping to generate interest. Physics for real women. Physics for poets. <laughs> Su poesia. My father feels he birthed in me the art of speaking poetry. He has two masterworks. In the English poem, our cat gets neutered. A central image is the lack of future kitten feet. A rhyme pairs calling with deballing. <laughs> the second, in Spanish, was inspired by a nasal decongestant. It took him two years to design this lyric poem on snot that starts, mocos vienen, 
Mokosvang. <laughs> me father demands of me, why don't you try once in a while to write something happy? <laughs> Escritura. My math teacher explained why not to be a writer. In math, you get it right one time. With words, six or seven times you try, you still don't get it right. El Código. Learned it in school also isn't quite right, but words at home weren't Spanish, rather a code only known to father and daughter, endearment, que linda mi hijita tan chula mi reina, in trouble, sin vergüenza y ingrata chiflada, and always, always, conejos, conejas, patas, patas, a song sung while patting my feet, while calling them hooves, expression of untranslatable love. Sin solución. Y tú, ¿por qué no hablas más? I fear I'll fall into passive voice when I try to answer truthfully. Se me olvidó, se perdió de mí. Not I forgot, not I lost, but it was forgotten, lost to me. Formula. Turn language into lengua and lengua into tongue. Put tongue into the body and body into home. Turn the whole house over and hold it to your ear. Now everyone's got a lenguaje that no one else can hear. Discutando. Walking with his grown-up baby girl, my father speaks to me in Spanish, words he finds hard to say. Only afterwards will he look into my eyes and confirm, ¿Comprendiste? Dos respuestas y una pregunta. Answer. Comprendo más que hablo. Answer. Comprendo más que semejo. Question. Father, Padre, Patria, how do my looks, how do my lacks, how do I betray thee? Correction. Why are you so sensitive, my father yells at me, when my overfeeling inflames his sensitivity, and I yell back, I wonder where I got it. Not in words, not in skin, but in twin raised voices, he is mine, I am his. All right. Um, and I'm just going to read three more pieces. Um, this next one is uh, a poem that is not collected anywhere. Um, hopefully it'll be in my next book. Its title is uh, Dworsek, which is a Polish word because my next book will be in Polish. <laughs> no. um, it is a Polish book, a Polish word that means train station. Um, and I modeled this poem after a poem by the Polish poet Zimborska. So she has a poem by the same name. My departure from the city of O, I took no leave. I'd learned to sleep angry. On a train, I was contained. The water under the bridge was just that, shunned metaphor. It did not send waves of regret or make me reflect. It did not baptize, wash away, or cleanse. The countryside appeared like the sides of any country where rain falls and cows chew yellow flowers. The world was not too much or too much with me. I stomached it. In the photograph, I only look lonely because I was alone. You cannot see the envelope on my lap or the letters lodged under sweaters in my suitcase. I carried only one bag, what I could manage in a crowd. You can imagine I held a thick book from which nothing could distract me. You can imagine my head high, eyes dry. I did not see my departure as a failure or a fall. I dodged a bullet been reborn. You can imagine it that way. Only none of it was like that. Not like that at all. All right. I'll just read two more. So um, I teach high school and in my poetry classes, I always, you know, give the students vocabulary words, which they promptly forget. But one word that they remember quite well is the word abad, which is a poem for lovers uh, departing from one another at dawn. And I'm always like, what do you guys know about lovers parting at dawn? But <laughs> somehow that one sticks with them. So um, this poem is called Abad. I wake and your face is a stranger's. 
I wait for fear or lust to whisper which kind. A dream crosses your lids and you mumble an answer, familiar now, stubbled cheek, slow smile. In your sleep, you ravel around me, hungry, nestling your nose in my folds. Is this what makes a family? The way we shelter against a darkening city, the way our blood-thinned limbs tangle in winter? Your head turns slightly to a sound beyond the window, and your <coughs> arms tighten their hold. Each night, we close our doors and trust each other. I knew I knew you when you'd change and not unmend me. Never before have I felt such absence of cold. And um, I recognize that tomorrow is Easter, and I don't have an Easter poem, but I do have a poem that has the word lamb in it, so <laughs> I thought, and, and nothing horrible happens to the lamb. I actually think I have another poem with a lamb in it, but it's not so pretty. So this is my positive <clears throat> poem with the word lamb in it. Um, so I'll end with this one, um, and it's called Little Song. Licorice sweet gum, darkly hooded plum, flesh and pith kiss quick fish tongue, pearl and strung sky, purrs a purple plosive sigh, hiccup skip him nimbly off my sides, rib walker from mung bean sprung, swelling seasons under sun, from tadpoleite to parasite to nightlight giving hum, impala wink, wink on fox feet, rattlebox and rain, rigmarole, gravity pull, quintessential little universe, this shotgun riding hitchhiker on swiftly shifting, tilting, lifting track for blooming trains. Oh, leggy lamb of lamp glow, soon you'll swallow turquoise whole, soon you'll drink my eyes, my voice, soon you'll wind your spring run clock. Tonight, I heard your shadows in my flock. Thank you.